Mr. Blackman is the 25th recipient of SVA's highest, one of SVA's highest honors, the Master's Series Award. Conceived in 1988 by SVA founder Silas Rhodes, the Master's Series has, in yearly retrospective since then, brought public recognition to the achievements of a who's who of designers, illustrators, cartoonists, and photographers. Among them, Paul Rand, Milton Glaser, Saul Bass, Seymour Quast, Jules Pfeiffer, Edward Sorrell, George Lois, Mary Ellen Mark, Paula Scher, and Massimo Vignelli. Now, Aro Blackman, revered by the illustration, publishing, and advertising communities for his groundbreaking work in cartooning, animation, books, graphic novels, and television, joins their ranks. If you've seen his classic commercials for Alka-Seltzer and Perrier, or his cover illustrations for The New Yorker, you never forget them. Those tremulous lines and spare bracket Backgrounds may seem simplistic, even naive, but don't be fooled. There's good reason he's been in the business for more than seven decades. Whether it's an endearing drawing, a memorable ad, a sublime story, or a searing editorial cartoon, that squiggly Blackman line works on all the right levels. A condensed list of Mr. Blackman's honors includes an Emmy Award for his animated PBS special, The Soldier's Tale, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Cartoonist Society, Ad Week's Illustrator of the Year, and memberships in both the Art Directors Hall of Fame and the Society of Illustrators Hall of Fame. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Republic, Harper's Bazaar, Esquire, Punch, and the Huffington Post, just to name a few. He's written and illustrated more than a dozen books, and in 2003, the Museum of Modern Art held a retrospective of his animated work. We are privileged to have with us this evening a major figure in contemporary letters, Victor Navasky. He is the publisher emeritus of The Nation, the oldest continuously published weekly magazine in the United States and flagship publication of progressive writing in politics and culture. Mr. Novasky was the magazine's editor from 1978 to 95, then its publisher and editorial director from 95 to 2005. A graduate of Yale Law School, he has been a fellow at institutions such as the Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, Columbia University, and the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. He is now the Delacorte Professor at Columbia's Graduate School of jo Journalism, where he is the chairman of the J Columbia Journalism Review. Before his tenure at The Nation, he was also an editor at the New York Times Magazine, and he's the author of several books, including Naming Names, which won the National Book Award, and Just Out on Knopf, The Art of Controversy, Political Cartoons and Their Enduring Power. If all that weren't enough, he has one other highly pertinent qualification to be R.O. Blackman's interlocutor. He was his client, commissioning a number of drawings for the nation, which you will see both here and at the SVA Chelsea Gallery, where we are exhibiting the master series R.O. Blackman. I trust that you, especially the students in this audience, will take something of value from this evening's conversation savor and enjoy the words and images. Ladies and gentlemen, Aro Blackman and Victor Navasky. Well, after that introduction, Francis, I wish you would sit here and I'll go over there. Uh, uh, Victor and I talked about, uh, when we first came here about what the format would be because uh, we hadn't uh, talked about it until this evening. And so we thought the best thing would be, uh, I'll show the visuals, I'll talk about them. Uh, then uh, Victor will comment on them. Uh, then there'll be questions and answers. I'm sure the questions, I'm not sure about the answers, <laughs> but we'll try. 
I'm going to say one thing before, yeah, please, before you go. I'm going to remind you of something which you've forgotten. Years ago when I came to the nation in 1978, one of the first things I did was I asked Milton Glaser, great Milton Glaser, previous recipient of the master's thing, to uh, redesign the magazine. And I asked them to begin the articles on the front page. And they came up with this design with two with a poster in the middle that where you could advertise what else was in the magazine, but an editorial on the left and the lead article on the right. And uh, they got nice comments on it. And my theory was it would tell the reader immediately that this was a magazine that took ideas seriously. I got one major complaint from one of my favorite cartoonists, <laughs> R.O. Blackman, <laughs> who either called or sent a note or both <laughs> saying, how can you not have cartoons on the cover? How can you not have? And we had designed it particularly so that we could have all of these great pen and ink cartoonists in the magazine. And the idea is that we would break out for special covers from time to time. But uh, when I finally got around to writing a book about cartoonists, I decided Bob was right in the first place. So <laughs> there we are. Well, you know, it's interesting. when. Uh, uh, Milton was uh, art director of New York Magazine. He made a comment, which I, I seem to be coming off as a very negative person, but I disagreed with him <laughs> profoundly, which was he said the only thing that sells magazines are photographic covers. We can't have illustrated covers. And that seemed very strange to come from Milton, who's you know, a supreme illustrator, and I think it's wrong. I mean, uh, th there are so many things that draw a viewer in and I can't imagine that uh, photography is any more compelling than illustration. So here I come off as a first-class kvetch. But, uh, uh, so l l let me uh, talk about, if I press. Uh, so my career started actually not with this image, but with this book. The image uh, came in 1983 when there was a second issue of The Juggle of Our Lady, uh, which I did in God save us, 1948, I was a kid out of uh, college, the Korean War was on, I knew I'd be drafted, uh, so I decided before uh, I get into the army, uh, I might as well see what I can do with what I really liked to do, which was political cartooning. Uh, th there were very few uh, political uh, magazines at the time, aside from The Nation. Uh, there was something called The Reporter, uh, but The Reporter really wasn't into my type of art. And uh, I decided, okay, maybe what I'll do is try to sell uh, a book of mine that I had done in college. Uh, I had taken a uh, seminar uh, by a guy who happened to be, uh, later learned, a colleague of Louis Buñuel. And uh, one of my classmates happened to be uh, William Goldman. Uh, I mention that because uh, for the class project, I did uh, a uh, book called uh, Why Rome Fell, you know, Kids Think Big. Uh, and uh, it got the lowest mark in the class, <laughs> except for what William Goldman got uh, for his uh, short story. Uh, but in any event, that's the book I uh, took around. Uh, and Henry Holt, one of the publishers I showed it to, probably to get rid of me, said, uh, you know, we don't publish uh, anything except something with a seasonal uh, content. Uh, so that evening, probably, again, just to uh, get rid of me and uh, thinking that they never would see me again, uh, but that evening I called uh, a classmate of mine uh, and uh, I asked him, uh, do you know of any good uh, stories that have seasonal content, something about Christmas or uh, Valentine's Day, Halloween? He said, yeah, I know a Christmas story called The Juggler of Our Lady. Uh, so I happened to have a copy of it somewhere and in one night, I can't believe it as I say this. I wrote the damn thing, I brought it in, uh, and they published it. Uh, and this was uh, one of the pages. 
and it occurred to me um, recently that, oh my God, uh, this was actually something that I had written in a letter. I have no idea what the context of it was, but how strange that somehow this migrated into uh, the book. Uh, uh, this was uh, something I'd done for the uh, Village Voice. Uh, there was a, a show at the School of Visual Arts in the early 70s, I guess it was. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget, by the way, that uh, a few illustrators, cartoonists had, were uh, in the show. Uh, one of them was Marie Sendak. And uh, Maurice liked one of my drawings. And he came over to me and he said, uh, hey, Bob, why don't we do a swap? Uh, if you give me, which drawing was it? I can't remember. It was actually another one that was in this show. Uh, I'd like to have that. You can take any one of mine. Well, I was so excited uh, that grabbing it from the wall when the show was over, the damn thing fell and crumpled. And so the, uh, the, the swap was over with. <laughs> Uh, this uh, was one of my bookends, uh, which uh, the uh, book review um, gave me an opportunity to do my picture stories, which I really love. I like writing, I love drawing, I love combining the two. And um, this, was, this particular piece was very close to me. I don't know whether you can read it or not from where you are. Uh, because I was doing a lot of advertising. I was very uncomfortable about advertising because no matter who or what the client was, I would accept the job with very, very few exceptions. And I was feeling very uncomfortable. I mean, here I started out as a political cartoonist, uh, but I was uh, doing um, advertising for some clients that were, to put it charitably, un unsavory. Bob, let me Yeah, give please, a please interrupt. Question. What were the exceptions? What were the exceptions? Yeah. What would be an advertiser who, that you would I don't say think, no? uh, I don't think there was a single uh, exception. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was uncomfortable doing them all. I mean, I loved the paycheck, and I loved the exposure, and I didn't pay much attention to the content. I, I probably was good as an advertiser because I didn't give a damn, and so I was very free with the material. Uh, which I think you have to be, no matter what you're doing, you have to be very free with it. You have to play with it. You can't be intimidated by it. Uh, to veer off, uh, my failures um, as uh, an artist filmmaker were when, was when I was too faithful to the original, be whatever it was, but when I played with the damn thing, uh, then I was fine. With advertising, I always played with it because I couldn't care less about uh, being serious. I'm, I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Or? Uh, what? No, I, I Yeah, didn't. There's, you, you did. There's nothing that you wouldn't do for money. Is what yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm all for well, money. Well, I don't know. So, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, no, I didn't do any cigarettes, but no, you know, no cigarette company ever asked me to do it. No. But I think, in principle, I would have stopped there. What's here? Oh, here we did a bunch of things for the nation. Uh, these were done, oh, 2005, I announced to have the captions, and 2002. Uh, this is a very early piece, God, 1976. Uh, and uh, this was done for Ruth Ansel when she was the uh, art director of the New York Times Magazine. Very different than the look that you now find with the uh, magazine. Uh, I find the sections of the Times are always reinventing themselves. This was maybe the most satisfying work I ever did. Uh, I think in 1990, I got a telephone call from the publisher of Story Magazine. Uh, we uh, would like to use a pickup piece of art of yours 
and we can only give you an honorarium of $100. So I said, uh, well, I don't want to do a piece of pickup art. I'll do something original for you, even though it was for $100, uh, because I love doing design work, uh, and I love doing covers, uh, which allowed me to do the best kind of design work. And that was one of the best decisions I ever made. Uh, if I paid attention to the fact that, hey, I'm only paid, uh, God, oh, it wasn't even honorarium, it was a token, uh, I never would have uh, done all of the 49 covers for the 10 years of its existence. A uh, kind of interesting story about the <laughs> story cover, uh, which will be on your left, my right. Uh, in I guess the 1960s, uh, Robert Brown John, one of the great, 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 great graphic designers, uh, visited uh, Tony Paladino and myself. Uh, we had a design studio in 1990, uh, and he had two gifts for us. Uh, Tony was given a beautiful gold period and I was, it was made out of wood and it was uh, perfectly gilded. I was given a cracked, beat up <laughs> apostrophe with peeling gold paint. And uh, I, I, I think that was uh, so apt for what our, our characters were. You know, but in any uh, company, in any association, there's always yin and yang. And he was yang, I was yin. Uh, I'm the one to the right. Uh, was my comment about the uh, power of literature. What comes next? Uh, this is one of the 49 covers I did. Uh, I like that because uh, I always feel that when the uh, genie comes out of the lamp, who knows what the genie will do? The genie might produce another genie. <laughs> but I, I enjoy doing uh, watercolor a lot. It's my favorite medium. Uh, this may have been the second or third New Yorker cover I did. And I ended up in bed for a week. Ooh, this was a killer. Uh, the occasion was the fuel crisis, and my solution was to go back to New Amsterdam and bring back the windmills. Let me, Bob, was that your first New Yorker cover? No, it was my second one. Your second one? Yeah, maybe what? it was the third one, yeah. Okay, I'm interested in the first one, first, just curiously. You got a call from out of the blue. Uh, will you do this cover for us? No, no, the New Yorker never calls happen? you. No, so you call the New Yorker. You call them, you visit them. They've been looking at your covers for 20 years. Finally, they say, this is the one we want. Um, how does it work? Well, I'll tell you how it worked for me. Um, I would uh, submit, um, actually, cartoons. Uh, and uh, I would always get a uh, printed rejection. And one day uh, I got what didn't look like a printed rejection. It looked like a typewritten rejection. But I wasn't sure. I thought maybe they're using a different typeface for the rejections. So I decided I'll give it the spit test. So I saw that it was signed by uh, Garrity, who was the uh, cartoon editor. And so I carefully put my... Uh, wet uh, finger over just a little portion of the signature and the damn thing blurred. He had written me personally to reject. <laughs> so for the next few years I didn't say anything because I didn't send anything because I figured, hey, I'm ahead, <laughs> you know. Uh, but then um, uh, Lee Lorenz became the next art director replacing Garrity uh, and um, I, I, I would show him a few things, but uh, the, the first thing was uh, the grass looks always greener. It was just a uh, scene of uh, different uh, meadows, and, and the grass varied slightly in coloration, and everybody was looking enviously at the other person's meadow. It seemed to be a better green than the one they had. Uh, I used cell attack for that. Uh, because I wasn't too sure of my watercoloring ability, watercolor ability. Uh, but 
this showed me, hey, I could do this stuff. So let's see if I can get to the next one. That's an interesting one. Um, 1979, that's when uh, the first tops of building were illuminated, and I thought that, uh, well, why not show water towers and chimneys and uh, other things that wouldn't be uh, illuminated. Uh, and uh, the cover wasn't successful, I thought, and I know, uh, because it should have been a five-color process instead of a four-color process in which the uh, gray wouldn't be the fifth color. Um, it would just be a tone of black. But fortunately, the Municipal Art Society decided that uh, for some occasion or other, uh, they would like to make a poster out of that. And that gave me the chance to uh, correct the uh, gray and have uh, the fifth color come into play. Which, by the way, if you get your catalogs, you'll notice that there's one image for, uh, 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 for what I call the, uh, the News of the Week, W-E-A-K, and it, it, it shows uh, uh, a guy looking into a Chinese dragon's mouth to visualize feng shui, and, and there a fifth color was used. <laughs> Oh, which made all the difference. Hello, it's not. Um, I was fortunate enough and still am fortunate enough to do a lot of stuff for the op-ed. Uh, and uh, uh, very often um, I would uh, use a photograph uh, as a collage element. And I was lucky enough to find the perfect expression of John McCain. Uh, and this was, I love the fact that there are captions, because God, I can never remember when I did these things. Uh, th this is interesting, uh, because I have the feeling that just as 20 years ago people became very conscious of the uh, devastating side effects of cigarettes 20, 30 years ago. I have a feeling that people increasingly are becoming sensitive to the harmful effects of sugar. And uh, so, um, in, in a way, I think this was uh, kind of uh, prescient. Uh, this was done when I think George McGovern and Richard Nixon were uh, campaigning for the presidency. And Nixon uh, had a peace proposal which he didn't unveil until the very last minute to get the maximum political effect out of it. And uh, at, at about that time, there was a uh, front page photograph in the New York Times of uh, a Vietnamese girl who uh, had been uh, napalmed. Before you leave that yeah, one, please. Before you leave that one, I want to just people should pay attention to Nixon's nose because uh, Doug Marlette, you know, another great cartoonist, once said that Nixon looked like his policies, his nose told you he was going to invade Cambodia. No. Now he said that after, before this came out, so. Yeah. Uh, this was kind of interesting because I guess it was the first op art piece, although it, there wasn't any op art section. Uh, my son was, uh, an art director at the uh, op-ed for a while, and I think he was the one who introduced op-art, which I wish to God the Times would bring back, because I feel that uh, cartoonists, editorial cartoonists, can say every bit as much as a columnist, sometimes more, but they certainly uh, 
can comment and should comment. So I was very sorry when uh, OpArt no longer existed. Uh, here was another collage that I did. Uh, I uh, found a piece of uh, clip art and just uh, stuck it in the voting booth. And here again, another piece of uh, clip art. Uh, the article was all about how mountains were being trimmed and devastated for cash. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, there's no year for this. I'm certain it was the 1990s, well before the uh, 2008 meltdown. And uh, one guy is looking in the pot of gold while the other guy, <laughs> same guy later on, is looking at a pink slip. We regret to inform you that, and I can't read the rest of it, I'm sorry, but you know what it says. Pink slip is a pink slip. Uh, what was this done for? Um, this was done for that um, political museum, the Wilsonian in uh, Florida. Uh, and they asked a bunch of uh, illustrators to do takeoffs on Norman Rockwell's uh, Four Freedoms. And so I took the freedom from fear and visualized it. Uh, and it's kind of untypical of my stuff, but I felt that I had to pay some attention to the Rockwell original. This is when I made a great discovery that I could use uh, gouache, tempera. Uh, before then, um, I had always uh, used uh, pen and ink and uh, watercolor and uh, airbrush. Uh, very often my airbrush was done by people like Robert Grossman. Poor Grossman, I would come to him and say, hey, I need some airbrush, and he would be very accommodating. Um, but then I found that uh, for large flat surfaces, hey, you can do it with uh, tempera, which is uh, what I used on this one. Oh, a little bit of collage. I uh, used a newspaper, reduced it in size, and that's what the man is holding. And this was uh, done for, obviously, the book review. My son migrated from up art no, what I'm saying, op art, from the op-ed art department. He, then he was in news of the Week in Review, is it called? The Week in Review. And uh, then uh, a few years ago, he asked me to do this. Can I say something terrible? Awful confession. My wife is going to kick me after this. Um, what happened is that he would occasionally give me little spots to do. This is a terrible thing to say. But I wrote him a letter, and I said, hey, Nicholas, you know, I used to do covers for the book review. <laughs> no, really, I did, uh, I did about four or five covers for the book review. Here, my own son is, is uh, edit, uh, art director of the book review. I don't get a uh, cover, so I eventually got a cover. But, I was going to ask okay. you, I just wanted to ask you what it's like for the son to go into the family business and what conflicts that sets up, if any. But uh, he seemed to not worry about using you on the op-ed page. I'm not sure what the years were of his, because he was there a couple of times. And I sat next to him the other night, and he seemed very at ease being in the family business, and he's one of your fans, so. No, we get along very well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a little dicey in the sense that sometimes I see things that I don't like, and I wish why didn't he do it this way, but I shut up, uh, because uh, uh, it, it's, it's not right. I mean, the way I would not tell anybody, I certainly shouldn't tell somebody who happens to be my son that, hey, I wish you had done this differently. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with the work he does, and I hope to God he's happy, as I guess he is, with the work I do. 
uh, mostly I find that uh, he's on the road a hell of a lot, uh, speaking or vacationing or whatever. Uh, so whenever that's the case, uh, that's when the Times calls me as the, the black men stand in. So, which I don't mind. I love doing this kind of stuff. Uh, what happened is in, yeah, 2010. So glad there are captions to these things. I didn't choose it, by the way, but they're very well chosen, I think. Uh, in 2010, uh, I was asked by uh, an art gallery in Bridgehampton to have an exhibition. And so I felt, OK, I really have to do serious stuff. Uh, so I did about six or seven paintings. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, and what I did is I took uh, little captions from the New York Times uh, and I hand-lettered them uh, and I collaged them uh, and I was really happy doing this stuff. Uh, stuff didn't sell, but what the hell? You know why it didn't sell? Because it got a review as an illustrator and that killed me because I think that's a kiss of death. People always think, most people think the illustration is a minor art form, and hell, it's a major art form, and it's often finer than fine art, because it conveys a hell of a lot more. You know, there's meaning, there's the, you reach people, you have to reach people or it's not an illustration. It illustrates an idea, and very often you look at so-called fine art, and what the hell does it illustrate? Nine dots, give me a break. Um, this was kind of a miss, but I liked it as a painting. Why is it a miss? Uh, because I went a little crazy with um, the artwork, and I think it uh, diluted what the piece was all about. Uh, it, it was all about uh, how uh, Prince Charles uh, wasn't too happy with uh, his, uh, his image as it was in the waxworks. But then again, I got crazy turning it into a work of art, so it doesn't succeed as an illustration, but it's a nice painting. Mm -hmm. That is my favorite of all time. Uh, I read about how uh, Iranian women were stoned, and I just had to do this thing. Uh, what is there to say? I love doing it. Uh, what happened uh, is uh, Stephen Heller had an exhibit at the SVA. Uh, well, there it is, in support of the Green Movement. It's, it's always great to have these uh, assists. Uh, when uh, the uh, votes were not uh, fairly counted. Uh, so this was turned into a poster. Uh, what happened here was on the day after 9-11, a bunch of contributors to the newspaper got telephone calls, hey, we need to have an image to encapsulate this horrible thing. And so, I thought I would take Milton Glaser's heart, which symbolized New York, and just have the Twin Towers as missing. And then it occurred to me that it was too damn cold and graphic. Uh, so uh, I did some debris falling, and I scotch taped it to the image, and I sent it to the New York Times. Uh, and I think it simply would not have worked if it hadn't been for the debris falling, which humanized the whole thing. Do they ever, Bob, ask you to revise something you said? Yeah, about? sometimes. Uh, I, I find that the uh, latest art director has been very, very good. I can't remember his name. All right. Uh, <laughs> done it. But he's, he's very good. Uh, you know, he will uh, say, in fact, once he told me, uh, I think it was the very first piece of uh, op-ed uh, op that I did for him, 
uh, it was about a uh, guy who had a factory and he wanted to have a tax donation because he had uh, a uh, religious component of some sort uh, in his operation. Uh, but it was very peripheral to his operation. Uh, so I did a uh, drawing of a factory with smokestacks uh, and I had a little chapel next to it. And he called me up and said, hey, Bob, uh, what about a human element? Put a person in there. And I did. It made all the difference in the world. So sometimes you forget what you ought to be doing. And, uh, and it's you, good to be reminded. Right. And do you generally want, it, in that case, clearly he told you something that you thought was a great idea and you did it and it worked better. Do you generally like it when they suggest changes or resent it? No, I don't give a uh, damn. Uh, if it's a good change, right. uh, if it's a good suggestion, I'll accept it. If it's a bad change, I'll say to hell with it. I won't do it. Uh, no, I won't. Right. My son told me I have a reputation as being a difficult artist. I guess I am. But <laughs> listen, you, 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 to be a good artist, you have to be a difficult person. You have to pay attention to the art period, nothing else. Indeed. So I welcome suggestions, and uh, I take them at face value. I could be wrong in judging them, but ultimately I'm the guy who does it. I'm the signature that's there, or the, uh, the credit line that's there. Um, so. Uh, you know, nobody's going to know that, hey, this is something that wasn't my idea. Right. You know, I don't mind getting suggestions. Right. And when you earlier were talking about the image of the illustrator as being not sufficiently appreciated, which I totally agree with you about, uh, I'm curious, do you see the role of the illustrator to reflect the opinion of the writer of the piece or to make your own statement? Uh, to to pay attention to the subject, but to make your own statement in the hopes that it amplifies uh, what the uh, writer had in mind. Uh, I, I think it's the obligation of the artist to speak freely and fully and honestly and as accurately as he or she can, you know? Uh, and sometimes it's amazing. Like I, I, I was once asked to illustrate um, an article that uh, Ronald Reagan, when he was president, wrote. And I did something that I thought was negative. Uh, and thank God, uh, the New York Times at the time, uh, I shouldn't say at the time, they probably would do it now, but they ran it. But I felt it was my obligation to, uh, to, uh, to either turn the damn thing down, because I disagreed with it, or to comment freely and honestly on it. Uh, no, but I, I welcome, com I want comments, you right. know. I, I like the idea that an art director, an art director has to direct to live up to his title and his uh, function and responsibility. Right. And it's my function and r responsibility to uh, do what is best for myself and whatever it is I'm illustrating. You know, it's, it's right. yeah, it's a, it's a play. Well, it's a killer. You know what? It's a killer. It's a ter terrible thing to say. Now, I submitted it to the New Yorker on the fifth anniversary of the memorial lights, and they turned it down. It killed me. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the, the Municipal Art Society, which had done my other poster, turned this thing into a poster. So, uh, so uh, that's the story of that. You know, I think that uh, Robert Grossman did the uh, airbrush on this thing. Ah, this is something I just did, uh, which I submitted to uh, the New York Times. I submitted, submitted it to the New Yorker. I submitted it all over the, all over the place. Uh, it, it's a comment on uh, Bloomberg's uh, nutty idea of rezoning uh, Midtown East for high rises. Hey, give me a break. You've got the Empire State Building, you've got the Chrysler Building, you've got the wonderful things that make New York, New York, Manhattan, the great city it is, and you're gonna make a Dubai out of it? 
uh, and uh, so uh, this actually was a rough. Uh, I, I wanted to make a uh, a final uh, out of it, but uh, I finally sold sold it. I didn't sell it to anywhere. I gave it to Landmark West, uh, the, the West Side uh, Preservation Organization. I don't charge them for anything. I just do it for the uh, joy and pleasure and privilege of uh, getting something good for an organization that I very much believe in. So what else is up? So that's the show. Hey, guys and girls, if you haven't been to the show, you really should. It's magnificently installed. <laughs> magnificently installed. Absolutely museum quality. I love what's on the right, uh, which are uh, a bunch of my op-ed things. And I love the fact that uh, everything is uh, blown up. Uh, and it makes a uh, great wall. Actually, this is the one thing that I, I told uh, Francis Di Tommaso. I, I, I showed him something that was a blow up that uh, was for the New York Times exhibit in 1999. Uh, they have a very small gallery and they wanted to have my uh, stuff exhibited. And uh, I wanted to make a retrospective of sorts out of it because you know, I had a lot of uh, stuff for uh, The New Yorker, I did 14 covers, I did 39 covers for Story Magazine, I did umpteen thousand uh, op-ed pieces, and uh, Nicholas said, hey, no, Dad, it's a small space, you have to have one thing, take your op-ed pieces, blow them up, and that's exactly what I did. So I, I, I told Francis, you know, sometimes the op-ed pieces blown up look very good, but it was uh, Francis's idea to group them together, which uh, I think was terrific. That's on the right. And that's another view of the gallery. Uh, my New Yorker stuff is on the left, and then a bunch of uh, my book uh, ends, mostly, are on the right. Oh, another view. Uh, a lot of my uh, early stuff. Some of it quite good. I'm amazed. <laughs> no, I'm amazed because my, my early stuff was god awful. But every, every, now, every now and then I did something that surprised me. Like upper left, see Rufus? Uh, I did that uh, when I was in the Army. It was for Coronet Magazine. Uh, and it's a hell of a good story and very nicely drawn. It's all about a uh, flea in um, the flea circus that was on 42nd Street then. Yeah. And see the cover for uh, Harvey, lower left. Uh, I'm amazed that I did that in 1952, a very nice graphic image. But most of my stuff was junky. Now we're really badly drawn. OK, that's it, except for one thing which will be the first public showing of, really, of, uh, of a film that I did in the 1970s. Uh, what happened is that uh, NBC was having a show uh, on uh, the, the medical dilemma, the, the, the problems that doctors faced, and uh, by extension, patients. Uh, and, and this thing was uh, something I turned out in, I think, two weeks. Uh, and it wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for the extraordinary animation of a guy called Ed Smith. Uh, I don't animate myself. I do the storyboards and the main drawings. And then I pray God that the right animators are available to do their sometimes wonders with them. And uh, the, uh, one of the voices was Anthony Holland. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Great actor. Okay, so let's look at the film. I don't feel well. Shh. My head hurts. Go back to sleep. With this head, press your temples. It will go away. I'll take some aspirin. 
my help. Please, every night you can't sleep, I can't sleep. I mean, you have to show some consideration. Where's the aspirin? Turn off the light, will you? I have to get the aspirin. Being joined to you is no pleasure. I'm sorry I'm alive. I catch everything you get. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Benzagram, Therazan, Methiotate. Where's the aspirin? I hid it. Have some hot milk and honey and go to sleep. A throbbing in my right temporal artery. One, two, three. Irregular pulsations. I'm seeing a specialist. The x-rays of your skull, your brain waves, and all the other tests are negative, sir, uh, sirs. Negative? But my headache. Well, that may be due to stress and purely emotional factors. But to be sure, I ought to give you a CAT scan. Absolutely. A CAT's what? A CAT scan, computerized axial tomography. That's a cross-section x-ray photograph of your brain, and it will show up any abnormality instantly. What will it cost? Hey, this is no time now. No, no, that's all right. It's in the neighborhood of $300, but your insurance covers it. Your CAT scan is 99% normal. 99% normal? Yes, but what worries me is that 1% that's not normal. Oh, that could be a problem. 1%. Only 1% worries you? I'd like to order it over from a different angle. The insurance covers it, right, doctor? Oh, absolutely. Then we'll do it, of course. Probably found a pill in his head. Negative. 100% negative or only 99% negative? 100% negative. But we ought to take a brain angiogram. Now, wait a minute. I know how you feel, sir. Uh, sirs. Uh, he feels fine. That's how he feels. But I'm getting a terrific headache. The dye we inject in the artery of your neck... Neck! What? ...goes to your brain and may show up the 1% area that concerns me. You think this is necessary, doctor? We shouldn't leave a stone unturned. The dye could turn him into a vegetable. But the risk is infinitesimal, less than one in a thousand. That's still a danger. The procedure is standard, and the machine is government approved. We wouldn't be a responsible medical facility if we didn't use the latest technology. But is it necessary, he asked. We should be on the safe side. Well, you just be on somebody else's safe side. Yeah, we're leaving. But your treatment! We have to give it. Why? It's all paid for. It's not necessary. It finances this hospital. Listen, I'm not a fundraiser. I'm a doctor. In this hospital. And our staff has to get paid. Drugs bought, food, linen changed, mortgage paid, empty beds filled. But I can't give unnecessary treatment. It's all paid for. It's not necessary. It finances this hospital. Listen, I'm not a fundraiser. I'm a doctor in this hospital. That's great, Bob. Yeah, thanks. How did you discover animation? And what did that mean to you as an artist? Well, um, well I love stories. Uh, I like to write, I like to draw Psh, animation. I mean, you know, that combines it and does more than it amplifies it uh, because you uh, have the, uh, you know, there are so many graphic novelists and so many storytellers who don't like the idea of, uh, of having this stuff animated when, to me, I look at the graphic novels and they're storyboards, you know, they're, uh, they're stillborn films, and I think I once spoke to uh, Art Spiegelman about Mouse, and I said, hey, Art, you've really got to get this thing uh, made into an animated film. Uh, and he resisted, I think, because he felt that he would lose something, when in fact, if he could control it, as of course he would control it, because he would have the final say, he would have the director's cut, otherwise he shouldn't do it, and he wouldn't do it. I think the thing could be amplified. Uh, but uh, I don't know if they're a answering your question. Uh, I, well, I love film. Who doesn't love film? Right. I, I had a hell of an interesting experience. Um, 
last year, I guess it was, um, a, um, a country neighbor of mine was doing a feature film and wanted to have animated titles and called me in to do them. Uh, and uh, I was looking at the uh, uh, live action and making suggestions. I was doing the editing, for God's sakes. And I suddenly realized, um, again, that I was a filmmaker, you know. I, I think that so many uh, graphic novelists, so many storytellers uh, are really, um, to use a fancy French word, filmmakers manqué. They're really, uh, uh, they're really filmmakers, except that the stuff is frozen uh, on, a, uh, on, on pages in, in, in paper. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that film is, is, is the great art form. It combines all the, the wonderful possibilities. I mean, the music there right. pushes the meaning so beautifully. Right. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, uh, the cutting, uh, the acting, etc., etc., etc. I think it's a much richer experience if. It has, uh, it, uh, as, as against it, it being uh, a, uh, uh, you know, on paper as. Right, great. Let me go back earlier to your discussion about The New Yorker. What it made me think about was, I remember I was involved with this little magazine which you used to do some great things for, Monocle Magazine. And if I remember correctly, you did an Uncle Sam pulling himself by a string with a pentagon on the end of it. So it was the ultimate comment on the military-industrial complex, which is great. Um, but Ed, I remember, went up one Tuesday afternoon to the New Yorker, and he came back very elated. It was Ed Corian who does those fuzzy uh, characters in the New Yorker that, you all, that we all know and love. And he came back, and for the first time, he sold one of his cartoons. But he was elated but consternated. He took out these 25 cartoons on, and put them on a table, and he said, why'd they pick that one? <laughs> and he said, because they all were, from his point of view, the same. And eventually, of course, they ended up using him and using, in effect, all 25, whether they used yeah. all 25 or not. Did you ever have an experience like that? Do you, do you, are you curious why they choose this rather than that, or do you suspect that they're right in their choices. They know something you don't know. Uh, well, it depends on who the art director was, but I often find that the art director is a middleman. Uh, Lee Lorenz, Nevin, he was the art director of the New Yorker uh, before Francoise Mouly. Uh, now he never knew what the uh, editor would choose. He would pre-select and then, um, sorry, I can't think of, uh, was it wasn't Ted Ross, Sean. Sean. Sean was a William Sean. Yeah, but I think after William Sean, whoever it was. Well, then it was Tina Brown, and then David. No, Randick. no, no, no. There was there was some. In between Bob Gottlieb. Bob Gottlieb. Yeah. yeah. He never knew what Bob Gottlieb would. Uh, he was as surprised as I was surprised, uh, and uh, so I, I forget I forget the question. Am I surprised at what is chosen? Sure. And he, just as the art director uh, right. very often doesn't know uh, what will be selected. Right. And, and, and it's entirely possible that things that the art director rejected, hey, the editor would accept. So, Can you describe the difference between, you know, Remnick Please. still reserves the right to make the final decision, but I assume the art director has a real role and function, starting way back with Ray Irvin and, yeah. and going through the ver Lee Lorenz and the various other, and Mankoff, the various, art, and Francois Mouly, if that's how I say her name. Yeah. Uh, can you describe the different, do they have different looks to the magazine? Oh, of course. Different tastes, could you well, well, first of all, there are many art directors uh, in The New Yorker, at least six, and they each have their own sections. Uh, and they each have their own looks. Uh, Francoise Mouly has the covers. Uh, Bob, um, uh, hello, uh, thank you Man so much. Mankoff Man has the cartoons. Uh, and then there are about uh, three or four who do the, uh, uh, the illustrations, 
which has a, nothing to do with the covers and w with the cartoons. And then there is, uh, I think Chris Curry is one of the uh, art directors. She's been around a hell of a long time. Uh, and then there is uh, an Uber art director who does the uh, overall layout. And a few weeks ago, the layout was radically changed for the worse, I must say. Um, I don't know whether they'll keep it or not. Um, so there, there are a lot of looks that go on uh, within this uh, one magazine. Uh, unlike the New York Times, I think the New York Times has just a general overall look, even though there are many, many, many art directors, each one for a particular section. Uh, and it must, it, it, it's, it's a very schizoid experience. When Rhea Irvin was the art director, Rhea Irvin uh, was an equal to, I, I heard applause and it's justified, um, he was equal to the editor. In fact, uh, Sh uh, Sean uh, told his writers to emulate the quality of Rhea Irvin. That's the high standing that Rhea Irvin deservedly had. Uh, he was not only a superb art director, but a superb cover artist, quite extraordinary. Uh, the nice thing about working with uh, Lee Lorenz is that he was a practicing artist. He still has stuff in the uh, New Yorker, and it's very good stuff. So it was a pleasure to work with him because his comments were always uh, very well taken. Uh, I did a cover uh, which was a takeoff on Lawakawan in which a couple um, are in, it was a Christmas cover, are all enmeshed in their Christmas wrapping, mostly um, lights that go on a Christmas tree. Uh, and uh, I had the lights as little bits of yellow. And uh, Lee said, uh, you know, that stuff doesn't glow. It really should be airbrush. Uh, and he was absolutely right. So of course I called up Robert Grossman. <laughs> and I said, hey, Robert, you want to do me a favor? So uh, he put in the uh, electric lights, which made the cover work. Uh, so, uh, you know, often uh, art directors are, uh, are visual. They know what the hell they're doing. Uh, and so one has to pay attention to them. You know, uh, I spoke when I was writing about political cartoons, I spoke to Ralph Steadman, the great English sure. caricatures. And one of the things he said was that what you can do with art is what you can't put into words, and uh, which I kept thinking about. And it made me, in the end, very self-conscious about using words to talk about art. Because to me, you know, if you don't like an editorial, you write a letter to the editor, or even if it's only in your head. But there is no such thing as a cartoon to the editor or a caricature to the editor <laughs> unless you happen to have your skill. Yeah. And which I think is one of the powers that, one of the reasons that people get so emotionally upset and engaged by cartoons and illustrations. And I'm curious whether you have any psychological theory about why people get so emotionally involved. Why, you know, the leading Palestinian cartoonist was murdered on the streets of London. Uh, they threw Daumier into prison. Art Young was prosecuted under the Espionage Act. Uh, you guys are have a are have a power that's recognized by the audience and heads of state, whether or not they take seriously the form. Uh, well, uh, we sugarcoat the pill. Uh, we do it by doing something that's beautiful, attractive. We do it by something that's funny. We reach out to people by means of our, our humor, our wit, uh, our succinctness, right. you know, and it's, it, it reaches people immediately, you know, words, you have to go through a long process to understand something, we encapsulate it right away. Right. So, um, you know, we're messengers of ideas, or, I, or should be in any event. Right, great. Uh, so, uh, and, and I, I, again, I, I believe that the function of an il illustrator is not merely to illustrate, but to comment independently, uh, visually, on whatever it is that uh, 
w we're asked to accompany. Yes. So, uh, which I mean, can get us into trouble, uh, the, you know, very often. Right. I mean, the interesting thing we were talking before about whether the illustration or the art should reflect the point of view of the writer or be an independent statement, and you made the point that it should be both, in effect, that it should reflect the... the it should relate to article, it, yeah. But it's your own statement. But I know in the case of political cartoons that go on the editorial page, I, I remember when her block was first working for the Washington Post, um, and the Post was supporting Dwight Eisenhower and her block was for Stevenson, they stopped running his cartoons oh, really? for a while, except the syndicate kept syndicating them. So then the readers of the Washington Post got sent angry mail, why are you censoring her block in the Post, and where other people saw him around the country. And after that, as a result of that, in part, her block was one of the few political cartoonists who got the right to run his cartoons regardless of editorial policy, which was an interesting thing about him. But the fact is, if cartoons and illustrations and images are, on some occasions, more powerful than words, then what do you do? Who, who should make the decision? The art director, the editor, the illustrator, the cartoonist? Well, who should have the governing say? Well, uh, the artist. I, I, oh, no, not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, that would be anarchy. Uh, no, it should be the uh, it That's should be good. the editor, and the editor should pay attention to uh, right. the, uh, the 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 quality of of of, of the work. Uh, I don't know if quality is the uh, right way of uh, expressing it. No, but you can't have uh, your employees dictating what should be the content of a publication. No, it should be an editor who has an art director that, that he or she trusts. And I think it's very important that the editor and the art director be right. on opposite sides of the table as equals. The best magazines are when you've got um, a Milton Glaser and, uh, help me out, the... Uh, Clay Felker. Yeah. And uh, I, I had a very funny experience. Uh, I did a sure. uh, cartoon story for uh, 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 the uh, New York uh, magazine. Uh, and I used two colors, a yellow and uh, uh, black and white. And uh, 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 I'm suddenly drawing a blank again. I'm tired as hell. Felker. The reason, I, the reason I'm tired is I was just going on 23rd Street, <laughs> wondering where the hell is this theater? Okay, uh, w w what happened is that, uh, I forgot the guy's name, the author. Clay Felker? Uh, yeah, yeah, he, he said, uh, um, this yellow looks very pale. And uh, I said, yeah, I want a 10% yellow, just something that uh, is very light. I didn't want to overpower the, uh, and uh, then uh, Clay turned to Milton and said, hey, are we paying for a second color? And uh, Milton said, uh, yeah, of course we're paying for a second color. And uh, uh, Clay said, we're paying for a full amount for 10 or 20%. <laughs> no, really, it happened. <laughs> and he would have had 100% yellow, except that Milton said, it's 10% goodbye. That's it. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's now the best, the best magazines and one of the best art directors was uh, Henry Wolf. Go back to uh, Show Magazine, go sure. back to Harper's Bazaar, go back to, uh, he was an equal uh, to the editor. And if you look at the old Vogue's, if you look at the old Harper's Bazaar's, and this is uh, back in the 80s and before, the art directors were very powerful forces. Um, then, uh, with th then what happened is he got the Anna Wintowers and the God bless him, the Alex Liebermans, who was a marvelous art director when he was uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s in France and early. And then he became very intimidated by, um, uh, God, I have, who, who, who's well, he was called creative director. He was a Condé Nast. And, yeah, yeah, but, uh, you meant. know, what happened is the Anna Wintowers took over, and right. uh, she killed magazines, I mean, quite literally. I remember that uh, back in 
it had to have been the 70s. I was looking in the magazine store and I saw a copy of uh, House and Garden, I guess it was, and I couldn't be less interested in houses and gardens, but I loved the look of the magazine. It was really exciting. And so uh, I not only bought a copy, but I s subscribed to the damn thing. Then it was taken over by Anna Wintour. And what happened, it was totally revamped, and it went out of business uh, uh, a year later. And uh, Anna well, Wintour is Vogue still around. Vogue is very thick. It has more ads than any magazine I've ever seen, well, actually. Well, it's, so. uh, it's a bad period we're right. living in. It really right. is, okay. yeah. Let me, let me ask one more question, and, and I think we should open it up and get sure, a conversation absolutely. going with everybody else here. Um, I was brought up, and I would see these cartoons that had appeared in the old Masses magazine by Art Young, whom I mentioned, who was prosecuted under the Espionage Act, which basically put the Masses out of business by Robert Miner, these great cartoonists. Yeah. And I had never seen the magazine itself until I went out to the Ohio State where they have a cartoon museum, and I went through all the old <coughs> Masses magazines. And that magazine was a magazine that where the words looked like the illustrations of the art. Yeah. The art visually dominated the environment of that magazine. And it raised again the question of, in conceiving of publications, and maybe the internet has changed all this, and I'm curious about your experience with it, who should be in charge? Because traditionally in this country, the art director is hired, has been in the past hired by the editor and reports to him or her. Um, it made me question that. Well, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, you've got to get uh, a very strong-minded art director who has a great vision about what uh, the right. art should be. And by the way, you were looking at the masses, but look at the new masses. The new wow. Masses. Yes. You know who was the art director for the New Masses for many years? A cartoonist for the New Yorker, uh, Richter. Remember there was a comic strip, you oldies in the audience, Strictly Richter? Well, uh, when he uh, first came to this country from Russia, one of his first jobs was uh, being art director for the New Masses. And if you ever have a chance to, uh, uh, I was about to say access the magazines, wow, that internet term. If you have a chance to ever look at the New Masses, grab it. That stuff is powerful, beautiful Great. stuff. Yeah. Great. So why don't you guys chime in and... Uh, I don't know who's in charge of the microphones here, but they were going to have microphones on both sides, and you could ask your questions. I don't know whether they're portable and can be passed around. Well, it could be my wife. Why did I give her the wrong address? <laughs> I'm so glad you figured it out. Uh, yeah, we, hi, Mo. Yeah, you can see them. I can see some here. Here's someone with a question right here. You want to pass her the microphone, or do you... Yeah. Uh, Bob, as you well know, uh, it's been a, it was a long tradition at the New Yorker, and we're talking about the New Yorker. This a is lot. Mort Gerberg, great cartoonist. You should all know asking this question. And, and a New Yorker cartoonist, important to uh, mention. Well, that. yeah, it, it, traditionally or historically, uh, from the point of view of cartoons, uh, it was begun where there were writers who came up with ideas. And these ideas were assigned to individual artists who had established certain styles and mm -hmm. approaches. And uh, that changed, of course, uh, in, the, in the 40s and a little bit more when people started to write their own things. However, it continued on in the tradition of a trying to really get into the magazine by paying a lot of dues. Uh, Victor, I remember Ed uh, Corn and, and I were kind of started at the same time. And many, many artists who were really established before uh, we had begun testified to the fact that you could not get a drawing in the magazine unless you had paid a lot of dues by submitting a lot of ideas, which from time to time would be accepted, but you weren't allowed to draw it. And that, of course, was the case you know, for me. I'm wondering. Well, you're all, you're all long submissions, and knowing you personally and your approaches to ideas, was it ever, did it ever occur that from your submissions they said, 
Well, this is a good idea, but we'd rather have somebody else do it. And would you sell the idea, which, again, was a beginning for many cartoonists like myself, who began that way? Did that ever happen? Yeah, if they said, let Mort Gerberg do it. <laughs> uh, no, I don't mind. Uh, no, if, uh, uh, there are certain uh, artists who would do it a hell of a lot better than I would. My idea just would fit somebody else's style. So if somebody, you know, I, I'd like the money, thank you. But um, I would uh, say, hey, uh, so-and-so could uh, render it a hell of a lot better than I would. No, but did it, did it happen? Not, not conditionally? Did it happen? No. As, but, but if it would happen, yeah, I'd do it. But, but one of the interesting things to me that Mort said, he was referring to style. And your style is so unique, and it, the line was described as right. tremulous. <laughs> and you once observed that it shows your lack of self-confidence. I think it's the reverse of that. But your style is so integral to your ideas that they're not, they may not be separable. And they may not be segregatable, which is one of the reasons that it hasn't happened to you. Because when you have an idea, you, you have a, a presentation of it as this everyman character who is in everything in much of what you do. And it has this kind of tremulous yeah. line that goes with it. Oh, well, you said, I'm so glad that you uh, said it's in much of what I do. It's not in all of what I right. do. Uh, for example, uh, in the two what I'll call paintings, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, there's some sense of me as the artist, but I think most people would look at it and wonder who the hell did that. Uh, but I think you adapt your style to whatever the uh, idea is. Um, so uh, that's, wh that's what I do. Well, just to add it on, you yeah, would be honored in that way. I mean, Adam is hardly ever wrote his ideas, his own ideas. I did stuff for Whitney Darrow and a lot of other people. They took these ideas because the editors, again, this is where editors come in, decided that the idea would be better performed, brought to life by another artist. And that's, I think, uh, you know, a great right. point you make about Well, Bob. I'll ask the question of you. What, 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 how do you feel when uh, a, a great idea of yours is, is accepted and it's given to a Charles Adams or a Whitney Darrow or whomever? Well, or when me. It, hey. All right. Okay. <laughs> but it, it, I would reply, as you did, yes, I had a good idea, and yet Whitney Darrow did it better or could have done yeah. it and did do it better than I could have done yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. You know, Bud, Bud Trillin once used to say in, in the Kennedy years that he had an idea, he couldn't understand why the New Yorker wouldn't buy it. Two guys sitting in their, in their club, old duffers, one, and they're talking about Castro, and one says, anyone who hates Kennedy and smokes cigars can't be all bad. <laughs> they never bought his idea, so yeah. there it was. Yeah. Anyway, so be it. Other questions? Yeah, there's... And, Why don't you identify yourself if you care oh. to? Uh, my name is Jacob, and I'm an animator. And I wanted to ask, um, as somebody who's produced animation, what is your view of um, current animation? Is there any? Are there any animated films that you particularly like these days? Or um, wow, what a question! Uh, I have to confess that I uh, don't much like 3D animation because mm. it's an uncomfortable mixture of live and uh, drawn, uh, but I've, I've seen too little to comment, I have to say. In terms of, darn it, I haven't seen that much animation recently. Um, yeah, I saw uh, R Rita and Chico, I guess. Uh, Chico and Rita. Chico and Rita, thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I was quite impressed with that. Mm. Um, what have you seen that you liked? May I ask? Turn the question on you, because I'd love to. i love to know what uh, is out there that I should pay attention to. Well, there are a lot of films from abroad. It's uh, a lot of animated features from abroad and elsewhere. Um, Where would I see them? Oh, a lot, quite a few of them are available on DVD. One's called uh, Persepolis. Oh well, I prefer Persepolis as a book. Uh, I loved the opening of Persepolis. It was fantastic, but it was a rotten beginning. But then it went. Th then it worked. Then it worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a good film. Uh, but uh, I, I was unhappy that. Uh, 
the, the book, as I remember it, started out with an historical survey of Iran. Mm. Then, boom, you, you got into contemporary Iran. Mm. But yeah, that was good stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you recommend anything else? Can anybody recommend something? <laughs> well, okay. Ron, you stay out of this. I know it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there. Well, a few years ago, I saw an animated feature produced by a husband and wife out of uh, Pennsylvania. It's called My Dog Tulip. It's I have to see it. I have I to know. see it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, no, I that I didn't see, but I have to see. Yeah. OK, I admit, I, I, I like the guy's stuff from what I've uh, seen of it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, OK, that's good. Are there other questions? There's someone up there. While we're on animation. Ah, hey. <laughs> um, Victor, you started to ask Bob about how he got started in animation. And I think everyone takes for granted anything can be animated now. And uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, when when you were starting up, Bob, you, that wasn't the case, right? I mean, your style, people were convinced that it couldn't be animated. That's and true. So can you talk about John Hubley and how you got into it? Because I think it's historically a fascinating. Yeah. Uh, well, what happened is that he saw The Juggle of Our Lady, and he uh, saw that, hey, this guy can tell stories. And so I was hired in 1954, I guess it was, uh, as a storyboard artist where I worked in um, the studio of John Hubley, who was a quite extraordinary filmmaker. Uh, but my Tell people who he is and... Uh, he, yeah. yeah. Um, wow. Uh, he uh, was very innovative in that he, for example, would uh, cast his own children uh, as the voices uh, in a, a very home-like situation. I'm probably not, but you know, uh, I always felt that the genius of uh, John Hubley was when he uh, had humor, that sometimes it was too serious. Uh, it, it bothered me, it worked against uh, what I thought animation ought to be. Um, but my stuff was not animated because it was considered unanimatable. And what happened is that it was always given to uh, one of the st uh, freelance staff of artists, one being Phil Eastman, who is the son of a son, who was the uh, father of. Uh, 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 why do I forget? Tony. I'm sorry? Tony. Tony Eastman, yeah. Uh, but my stuff, uh, well, maybe it was animatable, but, but, but it wasn't good looking. I mean, I look at the stuff that I did, did and then it was kind of horrible. Uh, so um, w again, what I did is I came up with storyboards, and then they were given to any number of uh, artists, um, some of whom, uh, some of who, uh, had uh, a fine arts background, and uh, uh, one artist uh, whose work I admired very much, he's not known today, is Gregorio Prestepino, and his work was quite similar uh, to reporter Ben Shan. Reporter would do things, too. I'm sorry? He would do things in The Reporter, among other places, I think. Wow. Yeah, yeah. good for you. I didn't know that. Um, so um, uh, John Hubley was very hands-off as I remember it. Uh, I don't think he commented much on what I did. Uh, he wasn't in the studio very much. Uh, he worked at home and uh, he was uh, very much an absentee uh, force in the studio. Uh, there was a guy, Gene Deitch, uh, who really was maybe more the art director in the studio than anybody else. Although I don't, I don't think that Gene Deitch, a quite well-known uh, cartoonist and animator in the field, animated filmmaker in the field, uh, I, I don't remember much interaction I had with him. Uh, so when, I, when, I, did you find, when did you find that you could translate your artwork, create 
really the animation because <clears throat> I I don't think I don't think people really understand <coughs> how um, amazing it was that his work could translate to animation at a time when you're dealing with essentially ducks and bunnies <coughs> and and Bob's using airbrush and watercolor and there was just nothing like it. There was nothing, and hasn't really been anything like it since. Yeah. When did you find that you could, was it because of commercial work and the variety of the stuff? When did you find that you could finally really translate your stuff? Because everyone knows you from the Alpha Seltzer, but that's not really no. your yeah. stuff. You know, that, that your stuff came later in the 70s, and it was, it was a phenomenal influence on not just illustrators, but animators as well, because it opened all sorts of possibilities. Well, you have to remember that uh, I was the artist, I was not the animator, and very often the animators contributed their uh, extraordinary talents to what I uh, am credited for doing. I mean, if you look at the soldier's tale, there are uh, any number of looks, good, bad, and indifferent, and great, uh, some of which I was responsible for, a lot uh, of which were created by the animators. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, there was a guy called McGubgub who was an uh, absolutely brilliant uh, filmmaker. And uh, he created uh, aspects of that film that I was strictly hands off. I said, hey, I want something abstract, Russian constructivist, and he did it. Uh, and. Um, uh, Tisa David uh, was uh, an animator, tragically passed away uh, this year, I guess it was. Her stuff was remarkably fluid, but more than fluid. Uh, she was a filmmaker, a filmmaker manqué, here I go with that French term again. But she didn't have a style of her own, but her filmmaking ability was staggering. And uh, every now and then when there was a weak section, I would have Tisa come in and she would do something to uh, uh, snap it into uh, a great life. Um, so, you know, even take the Alka Seltzer, for God's sakes, I did the artwork, you know, uh, and uh, I didn't come up with a concept. It was the concept that was brilliant. The whole idea of a guy and a stomach arguing uh, uh, about uh, what should be done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the only thing, uh, no, well, I shouldn't even talk about it, but the, the only thing I contributed, quotes around the contributed, was that at the end of the film, the uh, agency wanted uh, the uh, stomach and the uh, guy to shake hands, and I said, no way, you know. <laughs> we don't know that the guy's going to take Alka-Seltzer or not, you know, and that was my one small contribution to it. Uh, but yeah, but the, the the artwork was perfect for the uh, subject matter, you know. So it was the brilliance of the art director uh, from Jack Tinker Agency to call me to uh, do the work. It was an unusual look for a uh, nationally shown uh, commercial. Okay, uh, so uh, kudos on uh, the team that thought of the idea and the art director who chose me to do the uh, artwork. And for the animator, the animator was terrific. It was perfectly appropriate uh, for the job. You know, film is a very collaborative process. Uh, and I'm sure live action as well as uh, animation. Um, and, and so uh, it's, it's wrong that the uh, director gets credit for what rightly is the team's uh, creation. Right. You know, I'm lucky enough to uh, get just the right uh, composer, the musician, or the right actor. All right, so shall I choose the voices? So, okay, fine. Uh, but I don't create the music, which makes the big, an enormous difference. You know, what is the soldier's tale without Stravinsky? Give me a break. Uh, look at um, the only other largish film I did. Uh, no Room at the Inn, which was part of a one-hour film that I produced, uh, had the um, music of a composer who used 
uh, period instruments from the medieval times, perfect for a biblical subject matter. I can't imagine a score being more appropriate for the subject matter. And you don't pay attention to the music. You usually pay attention to the music when it doesn't work. When it does work, you're all caught up emotionally uh, and, and, and uh, vi visually. Uh, so, yeah. Good. Can we get a microphone? Hi. Um, since you're on this topic, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your CBS Christmas um, animation that you did. Uh, what happened is I did a Christmas card uh, back in the early 60s, uh, which uh, was a two-pager. Opening page, you see a guy with a saw approaching a tree filled with birds. Turn the page. Uh, and you see that he's playing the saw and the birds are chirping happily. Uh, then uh, I went to uh, one of the Walter Reed theaters during the Christmas season and I noticed they had a slide wishing the audience Merry Christmas. And I thought, hey, what the hell, no, hey, Merry Christmas, holiday greetings. And I thought, you know, here we're, here we're experiencing film and it's the 1960s, 50s, I don't know and they've got a slide, uh, th there should be animation. So at my own hook, I uh, created the 60 second spot, which uh, then the Walter Reed chain used, uh, and then I rented to CBS. Uh, so that's how it began, yeah. Uh, and uh, here again, I had absolutely the perfect composer, wonderful composer. Uh, and made all the difference in the world. He got the, the quality of the saw and the quality of the birds and the overall quality of the situation. Um, so that's how it began. Yeah, it was a flyer on my part. Yeah. Nice. Right. Oh. oh. Got a question over here. Hey, hey, wait. Now, I'm going to tell you about this guy. Good. He's, he's Paul Willen. I should have identified a lot of the others. Forgive well, me. Well, I know Paul Willen. Well, Didn't I have to tell you about Paul Willen. <laughs> Good. He's the guy I called and, oh, when uh, I got this brush off from Henry Holt. Well, you, you come with a, a seasonal story <laughs> uh, and we'll consider it. So I called this guy who's there now. I said, hey, Paul, do you know of any good uh, Christmas stories? Because I felt Christmas, you know, that's a big seller. And he said, he said well, what about uh, something called the Juggler of Our Lady? And I would not be here, I don't think. I really believe I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that I called Paul and Paul happened to come up with the perfect vehicle for me. Okay, so speak up. Yes. <coughs> I am Paul. <laughs> I am Paul Willard, um, and an old, old friend of R.O. Blackman. And um, after having so graciously uh, acknowledged my contribution, in quotes. No quotes. <laughs> for your uh, start. Um, and maybe it's not gracious of me to, to uh, in answer to Victor's question before about what you would take and what you wouldn't take in terms of uh, work. Um, and you said you would take everything except cigarettes. But we did have a little difference of opinion going way, way back, <laughs> which I <coughs> debated whether I should bring up. But it's interesting because it reflected a um, view that you had about <coughs> the work that uh, the city that we were living in and about the scale of, of uh, <coughs> projects. Um, and um, so your decision not to do it reflected I, something I, um, I, I mean, I respected your decision because I knew it was based upon a philosophy which was different than mine. And I was working on something called the Lower Manhattan Plan in 1965, and um, which was laid the basis for a lot of the redevelopment of Lower Manhattan that's happened in the intervening years. And um, Bob was consulting us on, on that. 
on some of the graphical sides of it. And at some point, you felt that it was not something you uh, really could live with, uh, that scale of construction and that scale of mm -hmm. that vision of totally redeveloping the whole waterfront of Lower Manhattan. So um, you made a decision. So I, I uh, reluctantly bring it up, but I thought no, we that's should right. have no. it out now after no, that's all right. 60 years. <laughs> uh, 50 years later, let's. No, I'd, I'd still turn it down. I feel very strongly, but not that, uh, Paul. I could have been mistaken, yep. for God's sakes. I've been mistaken about a lot of things, and that may have been one of the things I was mistaken about. No, but if a developer uh, came to me and wanted me to do something that I believed uh, fought my vision of what the hell uh, Man a city and Manhattan in particular should be, I would say no, yeah. I mean, I'd love to say yes, for God's sake, a job is a job. But uh, th th I, I, would draw, I would draw the line on a few things. Um, but uh, most of the time, you know, uh, I tend to look the other way. Figured, uh, most of the time, I figure a job's a job. It pays. I'll put the money in the bank and hope that nobody sees it and recognize <laughs> what I might have done. Yeah. Well, Bob, but you're modest and humble and no. usually talented. But I have a related question, which sure. is that, uh, which people ask me, is it an accident that most of the great illustrators and cartoonists seem to be liberal leftists? You, you do Vietnam, you do peace things. Or is that, do you think it's 50-50 in wow. terms of the... Uh, I have no idea, but I'm sure there. you're correct in saying that uh, a, a lot of the political commentators, a lot of the cartoonists, a lot of the caricaturists, yes, happen to be uh, progressive, leftist, whatever. I have no idea why. I don't know. What do you think, Victor? There must be. Uh, a relationship. I think they're poor. <laughs> no, and I don't get the relationship. Uh, you know. No, no. They're poor, yeah, sure. Yeah. But, uh, well, but that helps define the politics. I don't have the answer to that question. because That's a very keeps, interesting... Uh, but, I, but I'm curious about it. I don't just, know. I don't know why uh, that seems to be the case. Yeah. But indeed it does. There are very few, if any, right-wing cartoonists who... Um, have any kind of merit. I don't know of any. Uh, again, I don't know. Uh, I guess if you're an outsider, you no, I guess if you're an artist, you're an outsider. If you're an outsider. I think that's part of it. Yes. I think that's that's part of right. it. Right. Yeah. Existential thing. Yeah. Are there other questions out here? Or yes, comments? there is. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken? I have the mic. Okay. And, Good. Uh, uh, Bob? Yeah, hi. Who's this? Matt. Bob. Well, I uh, was speaking. Matt. Oh, Matt. Hi. How are you? Okay, got a, got a lot of old friends here. So now that we've taken a look at your mid-career retrospective. Yeah. Oh, I love that mid-career. Wow. <laughs> and we know that you're not going to be doing any work for Extel or Vornado on 57th Street. Yeah. What's next? Uh, well, I'm working on projects, but I have no idea uh, whether they'll uh, turn out or not. Um, so I'd rather not discuss them because they either uh, happen or they don't happen. Sure, I'm excited at the moment of what I'm doing, which will, I will not, but that doesn't mean that it will turn out well. But uh, sure, we have a lot of projects of all kinds. Uh, I mean, of course, I'm dying to make films. I love films. Uh, but uh, since I'm not doing films at the present time, I'm, I'm doing uh, books. Sometimes the books don't turn out right. Uh, and I never did it. I had a children's book that came out. It had a cover that wasn't mine because it was rejected. It was badly printed, and uh, I, I buried it, okay? Uh, I don't know why I mention it, uh, I, I except that you, you have to oversee every aspect of the production of something, you know? Uh, and I wanted to give the book up when I... Uh, uh, realize that my cover idea, which was good, and my son, who's very objective, says, yes, your cover idea was much better than the one that was used. But I'm afraid that it might be in the New York Times Book Review because my son, who works for the book review, said it happened to be on the editor's desk, so the secret will be out. But the secret is I don't like it. 
because I, I like what I did, but I don't like the production. You know, it was uh, the line heavied up and the colors were oversaturated, and it just didn't have that, uh, didn't have my look, that's all. Uh, sometimes your work can be printed better than you do it. For example, I did do a children's book uh, called um, Hello, um, Franklin the Fly, uh, and it went to Italy, and I swear that the Italian publisher improved my artwork, if you can believe such <laughs> a thing. So, you know, uh, you never know. Uh, there, w there was a film that was that I saw uh, a year ago. It was by Jules Dassin. Uh, it was uh, shot in New York, uh, and th the producer said, uh, "There's one thing wrong with the film." Uh, and Jules Dassin said, "What's wrong with the film?" I said, "Well, it should have a voiceover." I said, "What do you what do you mean a voiceover? It works, and it doesn't need a voiceover." And the producer said, "Look, I've got the final cut, and there's going to be a voiceover." I'm going to be the voiceover, and I'm going to write the voiceover. And you want to know something? It's great. It's great. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Good. Yes? You gave me a book. Oh, and wow. You, and you did not like the cover on it, and so you made your own cover and replaced it. Wow. Oh, wow. What was the book? Uh, I think it was uh, Shadows of the Sun about Harry Crosby. And you said, no, this cover is no good. And you made your own cover and well, you want to know something? Uh, I've, uh, I've had a few covers in which I paid for the goddamn book jackets uh, because I felt that a book isn't a book unless it has a book jacket. And so uh, two of my books have, three of my books have book jackets that I paid for. And you know the, uh, uh, the lights of New York? I, I pay for that goddamn fifth color. And I don't regret it. I'd like to have the money now, but uh, I don't regret it, you know, uh, because you, that's the thing you live with, you know. Uh, I happen to have bought a book uh, that uh, had a cover that was um, drawn by Robert Osborne, the, uh, the illustrator cartoonist, very, very popular in the 50s. Yeah, he deserves applause. And boy, is that a knockout cover. And I even have a book of poetry, it's very interesting, which had the original book jacket and over it was the revised book jacket. So I'm not alone in being crazy. Correct. So uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Correct. Got Can a I question over there. I'm Juliana Wu. I've Hello. Got to you. speak into the mic so we can. Hear. I'm Juliana, and I oh, yes. actually Hi. edited one of your early books, Caught Behind the Lines. I think it was 1986. With Hudson Press. Oh, wow. Got. And I wondered if you, if that was actually your first book, um, and that I thought it was a major success. You were very happy, I thought, with the, with the end results. So I'm, sorry, I'm wondering if within yeah. this decade you might want to do something along the line that would progress about your philosophy regarding illustration. Um, art, and if there's anything on your wish list, as far well, as writing a book that would be along yes. this line of philosophical, I, I can't remember whether that was actually your cover art, and, uh, but I remember no, that it? I enjoyed working um, with you so much on the no, book. No, it was done by a wonderful uh, art director, Bea Feitler, um, who was nicknamed Bea Fighter, because she, <laughs> was, uh, she, she was one of the art directors, Harper's Bazaar, worked with Roussin Cell, marvelous. Uh, no, the book was uh, designed by Bea Feitler. She did everything. Although J.C. Suarez, a name familiar to some, yes. was the one who said, hey, these are the visuals which you should have because they're kind of iconic and people know them and will sell. But I had a crazy experience in 2010, I guess it was. No, it wasn't 2010. It was 2004, 2005, something like that. Uh, I had a book that was accepted by a publisher, uh, and I had a contract, and it was uh, about Saul Steinberg. Uh, and uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, what happened is that I ran into problems with the Steinberg Foundation because they asked for more money than my advance covered, and 
made more demands on the editor and myself than, than could possibly be fulfilled because they wanted, they insisted that it have a more academic nature than was appropriate for the book. They said, for example, that um, the artwork had to have the dimensions, had to, had to uh, mention where it uh, was housed, who owned it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe they just didn't like the book, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I, 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 it's possible that the book is now at an agent and it may come out in a different form, which is to say there'll, there'll be fewer Steinberg uh, visuals. Cause I, uh, so, you know, but uh, I, I did come out with a book, though, in 2010, I guess it was. Uh, what's it called? Um, Hey, somebody must know. My wife must know. What's the book that I did? <laughs> Dear James, yeah. yeah. So that has something of my philosophy. That's a very interesting story. It was rejected by 32 publishers. I can't believe it. And I told my uh, agent, forget it. Just uh, bring it to the uh, University of S S Southern Alaska. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I want to get the damn thing published. It doesn't have to... Uh, but she eventually sold it to Simon and Schuster, where it bombed. And the reason it bombed, uh, even though it got a write-up in the New York Times, a full page, and it was an editor's choice, uh, was that uh, bad luck. The uh, publicity director left, and an assistant took over, and nothing happened. Uh, so, so the the book bombed. I mean, it was shredded. Uh, it was a shame. It was an okay book. I liked it. Uh, but, yeah, I enjoy writing. And so maybe this book will come out. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I hope it doesn't go to 32 publishers. But, you, you know, but God bless the agent who had more faith in it than I had. You know, there is a book to be done on the clearance of cartoonists and artists' rights. It's a great subject, and it's a complicated subject, so... I think our leader is standing. Is he trying to tell us something? We've got time for one more question. We have time for one more question. Make it a good one. Perfect. <laughs> good. Right here, right here. Yeah. You got it. Take the mic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you described yourself earlier as a difficult artist and maybe even a kvetch. Yes. And I was wondering if you knew that people who worked for you thought you were the most generous, <laughs> thoughtful, considerate boss I've ever. And I only wish there was more uh, oh God. time I spent with you. Oh, what a way to end. <laughs> what a way uh, to end. Well. He's an intellectual in spite of himself. This is very good. Thank you, Robert. Thank you all for your great questions. By the way, I want to say Mort Gerberg is a wonderful cartoonist for The New Yorker and a friend. It goes way back. J.J. Settlemyer, marvelous animated filmmaker. Thank God we had him in the studio. I can't go on and on and on thank with God. all the... Thank God I where I was if it wasn't for years. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks very much for thank coming. Thank you.